Our scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Hear now the word of God. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we continue our superpower series, and I want you to know that I am serious about this, that Christians have superpowers. Last week I defined a superpower as an ability or character trait that is supernaturally given or empowered. I'm worried that you are going to think that this superpower thing is just a gimmick that I'm using to catch or hold your attention. You might think, ooh, Pastor David is so clever. He's using superpowers to talk about Christian virtues. Or if you think it's cheesy, you might say, oh, what's wrong with him? I wish he would stop with the superpowers. But it's not a gimmick. I'm serious. I believe that the Holy Spirit gives us abilities that we could not have on our own. That the Holy Spirit empowers us to be and do more than we could be or do on our own as ordinary human beings. But I realize that it may be difficult to convince you of that. And take today's superpower, for example, generosity. How can I say generosity is a superpower given by the Holy Spirit when it seems like an ordinary human trait, right? We know that many unbelievers can be as generous, even more generous than any Christian. So how can I say this is a superpower given by the Holy Spirit? Perhaps you've heard of the giving pledge. This was started by uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett back in 2010. It is a pledge by the, some of the world's wealthiest individuals and families to give back the majority of their wealth. According to its website, so far 222 individuals and families have pledged to do this. They come from 25 different countries. But some of them surely are Christians. Many of them are not. All of them are generous. And of course, you don't have to be a billionaire to be generous. Many ordinary people give generously of their time and their money to help others and to make their community and world a better place. So since generosity seems to be an ordinary human trait, how can I call it a superpower? Well, I want to say two things about this. First of all, don't assume that the Holy Spirit limits his gifts to believers. There's more than one kind of grace. There's saving grace. This is when the Holy Spirit opens your mind to the truth of the gospel and turns your heart toward God. He puts faith in you so that you respond to the gospel with repentance and commitment. And thus the Holy Spirit makes you a child of God and unites you with Jesus Christ. That is saving grace. But there is also common grace. Common grace includes the good things that God gives to everyone, whether they will ultimately be saved or not. Jesus said the Father makes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. This is grace because it's undeserved. We human beings are rebels against God. What we deserve, all of us, is to be blasted straight to hell. Look what we've done to the world. But God is rich in mercy. And so all those who are saved are saved by grace. It's undeserved. And even those who are not saved receive abundant blessings from God in this life. And we call this common grace. And common grace includes all these good things. For example, having enough food to eat, 
or things like athletic ability, artistic ability, musical talent, could include good looks or intelligence, opportunity. Every good thing is a gift of God's grace. So, let's say there's a man. He's not a believer. He's never going to be a believer. He thinks Christianity is ridiculous. He doesn't even believe in God. But he is generous. He's respectably wealthy, has a comfortable lifestyle, but he gives away more than he spends on himself. He gives to provide clean water to people in the developing world, to provide schools for children in the developing world, and to provide technology to poor school systems here in the United States. I'm not thinking of any individual in particular. This is just a hypothetical person. But why couldn't his generosity be empowered by the Holy Spirit? Why couldn't his beautiful generosity be an example of common grace? The Bible is full of examples of God working in the hearts of unbelievers. Pharaoh, Cyrus, king of Persia, he rebuilt the temple. So the Holy Spirit can move and give gifts and empower even unbelievers to generosity. So the fact that many unbelievers are very generous doesn't mean the Holy Spirit isn't behind that. The second thing I would say is just because other people have an ability doesn't mean it can't be given in super measure to certain individuals. In comic books and movies, Superman is super strong. Well, lots of people are strong. No one says, oh, Superman's strength is not a superpower because there are other people who are strong too. It's not the fact that he has some strength. It's the extent of his strength that's a superpower. So we don't have to say that all generosity is supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to say that the Holy Spirit supernaturally empowers some generosity. I want you to know that I am serious about superpowers. I admit, I'm not above a gimmick now and then. But this is not one of them. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you have superpowers. Generosity is a superpower, and all Christians have it. Now, whether they use it or not, that's a very different question. But all Christians have it. And I emphasize this because the Bible includes giving among the spiritual gifts. In Romans 12, 3, Paul on a list of spiritual gifts includes giving. Now, spiritual gifts are abilities given to believers by the Holy Spirit. Kind of like the superpowers I'm talking about, but the difference is no believer has all the spiritual gifts. Every believer has some spiritual gifts, but no believer has all of them. Together, the church has all of them. It's one reason that God calls us to to be and to work together, but no single believer has all the spiritual gifts. And, and here's my point. I don't want you to say, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of giving, because that lets you off the hook. So maybe you don't have the spiritual gift of giving, but you are a giver. If you're a follower of Jesus, you must be because Jesus is the most generous person ever. He's the greatest giver ever. He gave up his glory. He gave his life on the cross. He gives abundant blessings to his people. And if you belong to him, then God's goal, his plan for you is to make you like Jesus. All Christians are givers. Now, some believers have a special gift for giving. And we see some of them in the New Testament. Uh, 
For example, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, she took a pound of pure nard, ridiculously expensive perfume, and put it on Jesus' feet. Many criticized her for the waste, but Jesus praised her for her love and generosity. Then there's Barnabas. He sold property that he owned and took the proceeds to help the poor in the early church. His real name was Joseph, but they called him Barnabas because it means son of encouragement. Lydia was a successful businesswoman who, when she became a Christian, immediately opened her home to start the house in Phil to start the church in Philippi, and she supported Paul in his missionary work there. So we see people like this who have this spiritual gift of giving, and I think that includes both a generous spirit and the means to give generously, to give large sums. Uh, but we see these people, and we thank God for them, but we don't say, well, that's not my gift. Instead, we should be inspired by them. You may not have the spiritual gift of giving, but you are a giver. You have the ability to give. In fact, you have a supernatural ability to give. Now you may object, well, sure, I can give, but I can't give generously. I, I don't have that kind of time or money. Well, that brings us to our scripture reading for today. The main idea of which is Supernatural generosity is not measured by the size of the gift, but by the size of the sacrifice. The story of the widow with two small coins is part of the passion narrative in Luke's gospel. Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he's come there to die. On Sunday, the day we call Palm Sunday, Jesus rode a donkey down off the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. He did this to intentionally fulfill a prophecy about the Messiah. By doing so, he was claiming to be the king that God had promised. And on Monday, he acted like it. He went into the temple and he cleaned house. He turned over the tables of the money changers. He drove them out of the temple with a whip. The result of this was that for a short time, the temple sacrifices were stopped. Jesus was enacting a prophecy against the temple. But he was also implicitly claiming authority over the temple. And the religious leaders in Jerusalem heard him loud and clear. And they resolved to get rid of him. They said, this guy has to die. But they had a problem. Many of the common people who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover, which was a big religious festival, they were gathered there for that, well, these ordinary people considered Jesus to be a prophet. Some of them even wondered if he might be the Messiah. So the religious leaders knew that if they simply seized Jesus out in the open, there could easily be a riot. And at that point, the Roman soldiers would come in, <coughs> excuse me, and then it wouldn't matter who started it or why, Pilate would blame the religious leaders. And that would not be good for them. So they tried to discredit Jesus in the eyes of the people by publicly challenging him with difficult, tricky questions about things like the resurrection of the dead and paying taxes to Caesar. But Jesus brilliantly answered their questions. And then he turned the tables on them, again, figuratively, and stump them with a question of his own. Their plan had backfired. So they withdrew to seek a more favorable opportunity, which Judas Iscariot would give them. Meanwhile, Jesus warned his disciples out in public where everyone could hear him not to be like the scribes, that is, religious leaders. Why not? because they were selfish in their religion. They liked the respect that came with their religious position. They were selfish and greedy. They didn't care about others. And Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you can't be like that. 
And then immediately after this warning comes the story of this widow and her coins. The widow is a contrast to the selfish, greedy religious leaders. The temple in Jerusalem was divided into several areas called courts. In the center was the, the main shrine, the building, the holy place, and it had the Holy of Holies in the back. Only the priests could go in the holy place. But surrounding it was the court of men. And any Jewish men who were ritually clean could go into the court of men and be close to the holy place. Surrounding the court of men was the court of women. Jewish men and women could go into the court of women, and the women could be close to the holy place, but not as close as the men. And then surrounding the court of women was the court of Gentiles, and anyone could go there. As one moved from the court of Gentiles into the court of women, there were large offering boxes, kind of chests with a funnel at the top, and people would put their money into the funnel, and it would fall down into the boxes. And the offerings were used to support the work of the temple. Jesus and his disciples were near these boxes, and they were watching people giving their offerings. Mark, when he relates this account to us, tells us that many people gave large sums. And then along comes a widow. Now remember, in the ancient world, widows were economically vulnerable. There was no life insurance or social security, no pension plans. Very few ways a widow could make a living. So widows were dependent upon their grown children. If a widow had a successful son, she would be okay. But of course, not all of them did. And Luke tells us that this widow was poor. What you need to know is that the Greek word here for poor is actually a rare and strong word. It means she was super poor. She was destitute. She had no regular means of income. She was living day to day, hand to mouth. And yet, she went into the temple. She took all the money she had, two small copper coins, and she put them into the offering box. And you might wonder, why would she do that? Why wouldn't she take those coins and buy a roll or something she could eat, right? I think the only people who ask that question are those who have never been poor. I have been poor, not recently, and not like that widow in the Bible, but certainly poor by American standards. And I have known many people who were poor, refugees and immigrants who worked hard for low wages. And I have found that the poor can be remarkably generous. They want to give. Part of the reason is self-respect. You know, I can't give what these rich people give, but I can do my part. I can contribute too. And part of it is about honoring God, whether I have much or whether I have little. Poor people don't always think about money the way wealthier people do. And one aspect of this is Giving can be an act of sacrificial love. I give and I feel the pinch. It costs me something. I miss out on something. Maybe that widow went without a meal. I suspect that she probably did. And yet, that made her gift more significant, didn't it? Jesus thought so, and he praised her for her generosity. Now, a few scholars have read this story in a funny way. They think that Jesus is lamenting the fact that this poor widow gave all that she had to a corrupt temple system. Now, it is true that Jesus had sharp things to say about the temple administration. But he praised this widow. I suspect that those scholars have never been poor. 
They may not respect the poor, but the poor respect themselves. At least many of them do. And Jesus did and does. Jesus said that she gave more than all of them. And if we take his words literally, he's not saying that she gave more than any one of them did. He's saying that she gave more than all of them put together. Such is the way God measures generosity. Probably no one but Jesus noticed the widow giving her two small coins. And certainly no one else recognized that of all the givers that day, she was the only one who gave with a supernatural generosity. Her example reminds us that supernatural giving is not measured by the size of the gift, but by the size of the sacrifice. Okay then, what are we going to do with this? You know, we have learned that all believers are givers because Jesus is the greatest giver of all. And we have learned that giving includes not just money, but time and talent, and effort and attention and caring. And we have learned that generosity is not measured by the size of the gift, but by the size of the sacrifice. How do we put all this into practice? I really can't tell you that. The Bible's number one rule for giving is 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Thus, our benchmark should be, am I giving generously and joyfully. That's something you're going to have to work out with God. But I urge you not to give yourself a pass, right? We human beings are so prone to doing that. The widow cheerfully gave her two small coins, but the American with a modest income can find a million reasons not to give. Now, I can't tell you how or what to give, but I can share with you an example that inspires me. Craig Blomberg is a New Testament professor, and he has written a book, Neither Poverty Nor Riches. The title comes from Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8, which says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. The subtitle of the book is A Biblical Theology of Possessions. Now, In this book, Blomberg gets personal and he shares his own practice of giving. And I'd like to share it with you. Listen to what he writes. He says, I was challenged early in my adult life by two different pastors who each gave 25% of their total income back to the Lord's work. And let that fact be known, not in an arrogant way, but simply to encourage others that it could be done. When we were first married more than 18 years ago, my wife and I committed to begin with a tithe, based on the very modest income we had while I was a graduate student and then increase that percentage if God increased his annual provisions for us. Over the years, God has blessed us richly and our percentage of giving has grown. We are now giving over 30% of our income to our church and to parachurch organizations and individuals involved in Christian ministry. This was our fifth consecutive year of topping 30%. At the same time, I must confess that we live in a large, comfortable suburban home it's true that our neighbors, for the most part, are working class or retired. We are happy to give good gifts to our children and to enjoy recreational activities, cultural and sporting events, and meals out from time to time. Although compared to our suburban friends, we do these things considerably less frequently. While I know of others who have adopted a much more radically simple lifestyle, God has not yet led me to join them. In short, I feel I have a very rewarding life, materially speaking, 
and are not particularly an exemplary model of sacrificial giving. I don't know about you, but I would call that supernatural generosity. Obviously, Blomberg doesn't call it that, but I would. And in the spirit of pastors who let the fact be known, not in any arrogant way, but simply to encourage others, I will share with you that I give 10% of my gross income a tithe to the church. And then in addition, I give some smaller gifts here and there to various Christian ministries and organizations. I do this joyfully and hopefully generously. I don't think that I give with supernatural generosity. I'm just doing what I should do. But then again, the widow with her two coins probably felt the same way. The point then is not to give so that you feel good about yourself. Oh, look at me, I'm a generous giver. The point is simply to do the good that God has given you the power to do. As you grow in generosity, you will become more like Jesus Christ. And just consider all that he gave for you, all that he gives to you. Nothing can be better than to become like him. Amen.